Our next speaker is an author, inventor, and entrepreneur. He's at a number of startups, is the chief scientist at the Swiss-based healthcare technology company, NeuroPro AG. Some of you may have come, by the way, from the show, the Biotechnology Showcase, the Cell, which is running alongside this, uh, which is held at Imperial College this morning. I was in partnership with NeuroPro. With his talk, Building a Brain Stethoscope, please welcome NeuroPro's Jamil El Imad. <laughs> Wow, this is amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Now, my background is software engineering. My fascination with neuroscience began when my good friend started his neuroscience doctorate at Imperial College around five years back. I started my computing career back in the 70s on the first generation IBM mainframes. And for those of you young in the audience who don't know what a mainframe is, these are industrial size computers that were slow and crashed a lot. <laughs> we had them in the 70s. And for over 30 years, my job in a variety of roles was to diagnose and fix software bugs. Now, over time, I got better at it. My eyes would scan through the hundreds of pages of machine code that the operators from the computer room used to bring to me, dump on my desk, and I would flick through and look for the patterns in this code. And all too often, when I see a bad pattern break or a deviation, that helps me look to where the bug is. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because these were the thoughts that were flashing in my mind when my friend Walid Jafali and I sat and talked about neuroscience and the brain one late evening. We concluded in the early hours of the next morning that if a healthy brain is rhythmic, then a neurological disorder must behave in a non-rhythmic fashion. If this is true, we thought, then perhaps if we try some pattern matching to these brain signals, we may learn something new. So in essence, that evening or that morning, early morning, we gave birth to our hypothesis. This being a healthy brain is rhythmic, and a neurological disorder behaves in a non-rhythmic fashion. Incidentally, this approach is very similar to what we use when we are scanning using antivirus software. And here, I want to show you how a typical antivirus software works. Basically, packets of data comes into your computer, emails, videos, documents, and then the antivirus does two things. First, it scans for any suspicious behavior, and that's a bit ambiguous. And then it looks for any patterns that correspond to known viruses that have been detected in the past. And the rest of the packets, the good packets, find their way to your computer. So this is how antivirus software works, but I'm going to come back to it in a bit so we can compare what we're doing. So we started this exciting project, and five years later, I'm here to share with you our journey so far. Having established from the neuroscience literature that the method we intend on trying had not been tried before, we set out to build our brain stethoscope. And two years later, with the help of Professor Chris Tumasu and the team at Imperial College, we started trials on human brain signals. Now, Chris suggested we target epilepsy 
It's a disabling disease with millions of sufferers. In fact, 1% of the world's population have this disease. And if we could help some of them by giving a prediction or a warning before the seizure strikes, we could enhance the lives of millions of people. So obviously, that gave meaning to our research, and we got all excited about that. Now, our plan was not to stop at epilepsy prediction, but if we're successful in prediction, we want to turn our attention to validation, to, uh, to intervention, and in doing so, complete the whole loop of dealing uh, in this disease. We believe that, given the trajectory nature of how our brain works, an early prediction may only require a mild, non-invasive intervention or stimulus. Now, here's what happens when an, a seizure strikes. And I'm sorry, to some of you this may be upsetting. But if you see on the screen, most of the injuries are caused, the, that are caused are physical injuries. People just lose control completely and hurt themselves. So, and this is what you're going to see now is how we want to solve the problem. <laughs> so, what do we want to do? We want to take the brain signals first, we clean them up. There's a lot of noise and artifacts in EEG data. So we take that away. Then we take these electrical signals and convert them to binary zeros and ones, as you see above me. What you see here is the machine representation of binary. We then smooth them, because EEG in its nature is not an accurate signal. So we tidy them up a bit. and we run pattern matching on them. And we separate all the signals that conform to the patterns we've searched for and uh, to one side and the signals who we classified as anomalies to another side. And this ratio that we get helps us understand whether there's a normal state the brother is functioning or it's a, there's an episode or there's a pre mark So this is how we wanted to solve the problem. Now, clearly, an algorithm in the lab is not going to solve help epilepsy sufferers. So our vision was to pack this stuff into a mobile device that can run in real time. And this is what we imagined the solution to be. We imagined a technology that would allow epilepsy sufferers to live life just like anybody else, while we monitor their EEG readings in real time. When our algorithm detected trouble in their EEG, we could send an immediate alert to any portable device. The epilepsy sufferer would then have time enough to get out of harm's way and prepare for their oncoming seizure in safety and privacy. By preventing dangerous and public accidents in this way, we might make a real difference in people's lives. Wouldn't that be amazing if we can do that? So as we continued this exciting research, it suddenly struck us what we got ourselves into. <laughs> there, was, there were many hurdles ahead. First and foremost, we needed to catch these signals in real time and not in a laboratory environment. We needed a device that can capture brain signals on the move. So we looked around, and we didn't find one. So what did we do? We decided to build our own. The headset you see uh, above my head is clinical grade EEG data capture on the move. So we got di distracted a little. And by then, we had two projects on the go. We were working on seizure prediction, but we had another team building this headset that you see here. Now, the trials on seizure prediction were quite difficult to, to run. First, you probably know most seizures are never recorded. And it was very hard getting hold of reliable case data. 
What was really hard, too, was running the analysis. Computing terabytes and terabytes of brain signals is time-consuming. And we tried all the conventional ways to try and speed the process, but it didn't seem to help much. So we turned our attention to cloud computing and thought, let's see what we can do there. And we built our own experimental mobile lab using cloud storage and processing. And quite frankly, the throughput we got was incredible. Trials that were taking us hours to complete in the past were literally completed in minutes. I was shocked. In fact, I was convinced it's not working, but it was. So we saw the benefit this platform gave us, and we thought, let's build on that. And maybe we can offer it to other research institutions who are conducting similar trials, but choose to use their own algorithm. And that's what we're doing. Now, imagine being able to remotely diagnose patients in real time and think of the benefit that this could give for people who have difficulty in accessing medical facilities or people who live in remote locations. We can do that with our mobile lab. So we turned it from a, something, a tool that helps our research to something we can uh, use and apply in the future. Now, given the computing power that we all now have, we decided, since we're all over the place, to go one stage further and build some new age visual visualization tools that can help us diagnose brain signals better. And here, I would like to invite my colleague, Michelle, and she's going to wear the headset that I showed you earlier. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> and we're going to have a quick peep inside Michelle's brain, and let's hope she's not thinking some bad thoughts. <laughs> OK. So fire up. So these are brain signals coming out of Michelle's head that are simulating the brain activity in 3D heat maps. What are you thinking about, Michelle? <laughs> Thank you very much. Isn't that amazing? And it's all low cost, low cost solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, there is two revolutions taking place in computing today. There is a power shift and a power diffusion. The shift is taking us from our traditional proprietary client server systems to cloud storage and processing. And the diffusion has come about given the incredible capabilities of mobile devices these days. Many of us are yet to realize the magnitude of what we are witnessing today. At our end, at the user end, we carry the equivalent of 10 mainframes in our pocket. And at the back end, we have computing power today, thanks to cloud computing, that in the past was only affordable to mega-sized institutions and corporations. Computing has become a utility, like electricity and like water. And this opens up a whole new space for us to look at opportunities in pursuing personalized healthcare. In a real-time economy, we need real-time healthcare. So, to sum up, what started as a research and picking up the rhythms of the brain, expanded to a promising research in seizure prediction, to the building of a headset that can be universally used, to a mobile lab that can speed up research trials, and some beautiful visualization tools that can help in the assisted diagnosis. And in fact, we're using this technology now 
working with Professor Thomas Grunwald and his team at the Swiss Epicenter for the monitoring of coma patients. And it all grew out of a late night discussion between a computer programmer and a neuroscience researcher thinking outside the box. I do hope that my story supports the notion that innovation and planning are incompatible. And what may appear to be a challenge, if addressed, may turn out to be the opportunity we need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy, if you could stay there for one minute. There's sure. a number of people who came in with questions, which we can narrow down to three very, very simple questions. The first is, in reaction to the video you showed there, and Kate Humble's unfortunate event in the garden, uh, the, uh, when you show the video and you give the warning, how long a warning can you give? Uh, okay, that's a very good uh, question, because seizure prediction, uh, there isn't a set time. Right. We're working, we have in some of the trials, which are not validated yet, but we have caught pre-markers about 45 minutes or an hour before. Okay, fine. Does that mean if an hour passes? So, so if, if, we're, if we're successful in what we're doing and we get that prediction, then that person will know over time that to expect it within the 45 minutes. But also now. that the danger will have passed after a certain amount of time. The danger will not pass until we apply intervention. But at least the patient can actually take caution, okay. go and be safe so they don't physically injure themselves. Okay, Grant. Uh, are there other conditions other than epilepsy you think that this could also be used for? Well, the headset in itself can be used for uh, a neurofeedback. There's many opportunities. As I said earlier, we're using it now for uh, monitoring of coma patients. We have a research going on. So there could be, it's a universal. The headset in itself is, is independent. The prediction algorithm is something else. And then all this other stuff is something else as well. So every item, every, every uh, uh, piece of work we're working on is independent in its nature. It's kind of run on the top. And how long, because that, uh, that ad, as it were, is an idea, idealized, a kind of a possible future image of how, how long before we will get to that? Most of the components we're building will be available in the next 12 months out. So the headset will be available, the mobile lab, and Eurovis, the visualization tools. For the uh, seizure prediction, we are working on the validation. And we are hoping within the next 24 months we will have some concrete, but we have very encouraging results. Fantastic. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Jamil El Imad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.